All right. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Music, Philosophy, and More. Today, I'm with a very special guest, Hannah Austin. Welcome, Hannah. Thanks, John. Glad to be here. Yeah, very glad to have you here. This is going to be an exciting talk. It's going to be a little bit different. My uh, talks so far have been pretty much uh, music uh, a lot of times with my guy friends, and this is uh, your new friend, and we're going to be talking about, we might touch on music, but We'll be talking about a lot more than that too. So this is very uh, exciting. Um, so I see that we're on Facebook now. So if you could find the uh, show, uh, Hannah, if you could find it on my Facebook page and you can go ahead and share it to your page. It should be popping up in a few seconds if you don't see it yet. So for our listener audience, um, what we're doing is we're uh, enabling more people to join the live stream. So once the show pops up on Facebook, then people can begin to share it to their own page or to groups. So um, you might have to refresh if you don't see it, refresh Facebook and then you go down. Yeah, I'm seeing, I'm seeing it on my page. Actually, I could share it to your page. I'm going to do that. Sure. Yeah. I'm not quite sure why it's not sharing. I know Amy had the same problem. So yeah, sharing the, are you seeing the zoom meeting there? Yes. All right. All right, cool. So I'm sharing it to your page and then you could just check your page to see if you see it there. Might take a minute. All right, cool. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to get started with some questions in a minute. Uh, just a brief uh, explanation to the for the listener audience that uh, Hannah and I met in a uh, book group uh, with the book doulas, and the book doulas are two people, um, Christine Carlson and Deborah Evans, who help. Uh, people of all backgrounds and levels uh, of, of authorship to bring their book into the world, just like what it sounds like. And I thought it was a fantastic experience. How'd you feel about it, Hannah? It was incredible. I think, you know, like you commented, I think we've meet, met a lot of people, spent a lot of time with a lot of folks, learned a lot of new tips, tricks, um, on how to write books. And, and it's not just about writing books, it's about learning the business of writing books. So it's, it was a great, great um, learning experience. And so glad I met you as well. Yeah, absolutely. Ditto. And uh, by the way, I'm checking out, it, it seems to be live on your page too. So your friends should be able to find it on your page, our show right now. So I see it there. All right. So I'm going to start uh, jumping into some questions. <clears throat> so um, we might, we might get some questions as we go. And so here's Haley saying, Hey friends, what's going on Haley? Thanks for uh, thanks for tuning in. Glad to see you here. So let's let's dive right into uh, to your background. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Anything you'd like to share? Where'd you grow up? I know you were not a stationary person. And where do you live now? Sure. Thanks for asking. Um, I was born in Palmer, Alaska, and lived there pretty much on and off um, through high school. And I was raised as an only child. So I currently live in Portland, Oregon, which I'm here today um, with my husband, Peter, of 15 years. We'll celebrate our 15 wedding anniversary in August. And Palmer's our mini Bernadoodle. She's like our child. So um, she's a doll and a delight for us. Oh, wow. So did, did you said Portland, Oregon is where you are now? Yes. Portland, Oregon, yes. And we were actually having a brownout. So I just, my power just went out 30 minutes ago, John. So I raced over to uh, this air conditioned conference room. So I'm so happy to be here with you in the cool weather. Nice. Cool. So you guys are having a lot of heat over there too, I assume? Then? We are. Today is, I think, a 112 or 115. So everyone's dying in Portland. Holy cow. I didn't know Oregon got that hot. Huh? I had no idea. It doesn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> So this is a freak, uh, freak of nature. Moment. Freak of nature today. <laughs> cool. Yeah, we got a heat wave too, by the way, in Brooklyn, New York. Um, it's like a warning this whole week. And oh, I was out doing a little housework and I love the heat, but it was getting to me too. So stay cool. Yeah, definitely. All right, cool. So thanks for that. Um, 
So I understand that from beginning from a young age, you traveled the world. Yeah. Now, can you tell us what was that like and how does that inform the way you live today? Because I'm sure that would affect you as an adult. It does. Yeah, I had an incredible childhood. Um, when I was four years old, my parents resigned from their jobs, sold everything that they owned, and we traveled around the world for several years. So I've lived in Bali, Australia, Thailand. I've hiked in the Himalayas. I slept on the plains of Africa. The experience really changed my life drastically. And I was exposed to so many different cultures and different walks of life at such a young age. And I think, John, it made me uh, see the world differently. Um, I grew up very quickly being raised around adults and living outside of my comfort zone. So I'm pretty comfortable with the uncomfortable. Um, it was lonely at times, uh, just being my mom, dad, and I, but I learned to make friends quickly, even though they didn't speak the same language as I. So it, it really changed me a lot. And I think I've learned so much, just have a worldly perspective versus just kind of a black and white one. Yeah, wow. And also, I guess that you didn't live in just one town for right. most of your life that nope. uh, would also contribute. Um, well, yeah, because you, you, so not only did you travel, but you were actually, were you living in these other places too? Yeah, so we basically went from place to place. So Bali was our longest stint. We were there about six months. And of course you have to leave because you have to renew your visa. So then I was, we went to Australia, went to boarding school there for a while. Then we came back to Bali. Uh, you know, mostly the Thailand trips, Cambodia, Nepal, you know, those are two to three month stints or however long our visa would allow. Um, and then, you know, we would try to come back to the United States just to kind of debrief and, and feel a little bit normal and feel like we have citizenship somewhere and to see friends and family. But other than that, we were literally in multiple suitcases traveling the beaten path. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, my, you know, my family is a, myself, my wife and a son, we have an only child and we imagine that will, it will be an only child unless who knows can that, but it's not planned at all, but that's probably what it will be. So we would love to travel the world too. And I'm, just can't imagine how intense that is, you know, as parents for you too. I guess you just trusted your parents in the well, world. Well, my parents, I, I don't, I didn't think about it now because I was like, what, four and six. But now that I look back, I mean, how brave they were to do that, first of all, yeah. sell everything they own and just take that leap of faith. <laughs> but then also with such a young child and a, a young girl, right? So I had blonde hair, blue eyed. I looked like that little girl from Poltergeist. And I would go to these countries and I would be a minority. And so it was really, it's almost a juxtaposition of, you know, a lot of people come to our country and they're minorities, but I was the one in their country, right? So they, they treated me and they looked at me very differently. And I was used to being stared at because I didn't look similar to them and we didn't speak the same language. So like I said, I'm comfortable in the uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. That's uh must be so valuable. So I grew up just, just as a, like a counterpoint yeah. here. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, a um, place called Marine Park, and uh, <clears throat> in a pretty much a, a white middle-class neighborhood. And I uh, went to Catholic school. Um, you know, I had some interaction with other, other races, not really other religions much until high school. And uh, um, I, I had the fortune of traveling to Norway a few times uh, when I was three, then when I was nine, several times in my childhood. So I realized that my life was bigger than this Brooklyn life and that I, I had roots somewhere else, you know? And so there was this, this like sense of importance that I, I don't know how else to describe it, that my life was meaningful, you know? And that, so I had more respect, I think, than the people around me then the kids I grew up with, there was a different level of respect for elders, for women, yes. you know, for mother figures and stuff. So I just, uh, I definitely have to credit that traveling to and, and staying weeks at a time in Norway and within a very different culture, a lot more nature yeah. oriented, family oriented, you know, so I can only imagine how that has uh, had a similar effect on you. But of course, it was even that much more adventurous and unpredictable. Yeah, when I was, you know, we talked about this in our book, du book doula class where you and I met about, you know, writing this book about traveling around the world. And, and the beginning of my book was titled basically Roots and Wings, right? So your parents teach you kind of the foundation of who you are and what to do and how to act and how to behave. But then part of their job also is to give you, set you off into the world, right? So I, I really love the 
juxtaposition of roots where you're rooted in one place, but you also have the opportunity to have wings. So, mm -hmm. nice. so is that your working title or is that your title? Oh gosh, John, you and I've talked about this, I think mm -hmm. with our group too. I mean, I was set out to write this book about being a citizen of the world, right? Which is what I was basically when I grew up. And then, and we'll probably get into this later, a few questions down the line, but what's really drawn to me right now at this time of my life is making a difference in women's lives and, and impacting that. So like I said, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but the book that I'm currently working on right now um, is called um, From Burnout to Brilliance. Right. Perfect. So my experience about burning out and then turning it on to, you know, a new way of life and really reflecting that brilliance around the world. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah. So so the, the roots to wings is, is kind of like a uh, potential autobiography memoir in the future. Maybe? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. So Ali, Ali has also joined us, Ali Brumwell. So good to hear your voices again, she says. And hello, Hannah and John and Haley. Hey, Ali. Good to see you here, you and Haley. It's a, uh, it's like class reunion. It is. Oh, I miss them so much. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. All right. So moving on. Um, so I see. Uh, I've learned that you focused on science and then then business in your university days. So have you always been drawn to those fields? Uh, seeing your personality, I wouldn't have guessed that. But business, yeah, the science, I wouldn't have guessed. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, I always wanted to be a neurologist. I don't know why. I thought, you know, brain surgeon sounded pretty cool. Why not aim high? But, um, you know, once I took organic chemistry, I really realized I didn't learn well through memorization. I'm more of a people person to what you said. I love people. I'm a kinesthetic learner. So I started my first business in elementary school. I had a garage sale business. Um, and I was marketing director and my best friend was the CFO and it was pretty profitable. We did a really good job. So I just realized that I loved managing people and business really led me to earning my MBA. So. Wow. So when you, when you were going to science, uh, yeah. what, what, uh, science particularly were you studying out of curiosity? Uh, I was pre-med. So, uh, right. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm, oh, I'm I a doctor. Yeah. Uh -huh. wow. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. But now yeah. I just manage them. Mm. <laughs> Right. I, I uh, when I hear science, I don't I don't necessarily make that leap to uh, medicine. You know, I don't. Yeah. But, uh, I can see that. Um, cool. And and then you, and then you said business was just kind of your personality. Yeah. Just naturally, you went into that. I like to be in charge too, John. So that was kind of natural. You know, you're able to start company, manage people, and work through people, and and work through influence. I should say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I notice you have a very strong personality. Um, yeah, you know, you know, we notice things, and I, because like, uh, uh, you know, as a contrast myself, I'm not, uh, I don't, I, I'm, I'm a business person to whatever extent I need to be to survive, but I really do not have any attraction to that field. So it's fascinating to me that someone does, you know, yeah. you know, it's like hey, we're all we're all made very uniquely, you know. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, so. Can you speak about your 20 year career in healthcare and how that has helped you to prepare for where you are today in life? 20 year career is that's, you know, no joke. Yeah, it's no joke. I feel like I've lived a long life, my 41 years, but um, yeah, so great question. You know, my career in healthcare, I held a variety of different roles throughout several healthcare companies of the last 20 years. At the age of 22, my first job was to manage about 50 staff members and 100 patients. And it was quite a challenge and I was intimidated at first, but then I quickly realized that if you create a strong relationship with people of foundation of staff, patients and their families, I could actually get work done. So if they knew me, they felt like they could trust me. Um, I knew them, I knew what their pain points were and how I could help them. It was a mutual, you know, a mutual benefit. So I had a lot of energy back then in my twenties and I felt like I could make a real difference. Um, and that fueled me, you know, that, that wanting to make a difference really fueled me and propelled me from moving forward. And when I look back on kind of each of my roles throughout my career, I can see how each one has really been a building block to create a foundation for me of like knowledge, confidence, and growth. So, you know, I was actually looking forward to moving up in my career and becoming a COO or doing something different because, you know, it just kind of that natural fluid transition but I really found myself missing the patients and missing that more personal connection where I could see the actions that I was making every single day actually translate to impact. Hmm. So of those 20 years, were you pretty much 
involved with patients' lives the whole time? Yeah, I mean, I, from when I was 21, 22 years old to, you know, when I just left my job in January, that the patients were a big aspect of my career, you know, whether it was managing their lives behind the scenes or making sure that they were safely transferred to where they needed to be or getting life-saving treatments on dialysis. I mean, you name it, I, I was kind of behind the scenes doing that. Well, yeah, I can't really picture what healthcare field, you know, I just don't yeah. know. Yeah. Um, yeah, besides doctors and nurses, I have a rough idea what that's about, you know, Yeah. but behind the scenes, I, I don't really know how it works. Well, I think if I could translate it to music, it's basically I was the conductor, right? Mm -hmm. I was kind of, you know, responsible for, you know, that person's going to surgery, that person's discharging home, this person didn't show up for, to work today, this person did, and we're short staffed. I mean, just really kind of choreographing in your world, the music. Oh, okay, I see. So, and, and what's what's that role called again? Just being the conductor, right? So- right, I mean, Yeah, no, I know, in, in the healthcare world, oh, what, what would that oh, position be called? Director, CEO, regional manager. Oh, and, really? You know, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so you, then you're like in a hospital every day type of thing? Um, I had a hospital responsibilities and clinic responsibilities. So in my last role, I was able to work from home some days, I could go to the clinic, um, I could talk to direct patients if I wanted to. I could sit in the lobby and ask them how their experience has been. It really gave me a wide range of kind of job opportunities to choose from and, and different people I could speak with. I was able to help control the service and care experience side, but then also the clinical side. So basically the whole picture. Mm -hmm. So when, just again, to help me <laughs> fill in the details, when a patient would see you, how would they understand you your role if, not, if you're not a doctor or a nurse yeah i would basically introduce myself and just say you know my job is to support the physicians the nurses the, the care managers to get you home safely um if you had a positive experience i want to hear about it if you had a negative experience let's talk about what happened and how i can change right how i can change your experience um so i basically you know was there almost advocate in a way, but also they knew that if they had a complaint or a concern or something positive, that I would communicate that out. And if it was a negative experience, fix it so it didn't happen again. And if it was mm -hmm. a positive experience, share that with the community. So you're kind of like the face of the bigger this yeah. medical yes. uh, facade or, or whatever structure. Right. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Definitely sounds intense. <laughs> Uh, so Ali says that um, great analogy, Hannah, I suppose about the conductor and Ali was a nurse for 20 years. So I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. Uh, Ali, sure. Thanks for sharing. Um, okay, cool. So, <clears throat> so I understand that you have had, so we'll get to, I suppose, how that healthcare bit came, chapter came to a close, but I understand that you uh, been experiencing you have experienced as a mentor for young women yeah um so what are your thoughts on mentorship and do you believe that having a mentor is crucial for a young persons reaching a, a young person reaching their full potential i do you know mentoring young women was kind of one of the best, biggest honors and my favorite part of my career um i feel very fortunate to have had three strong business women mentor me over the last two decades, from my first boss at Alaska Magazine and the Milepost to my second boss, who is the COO of Spectrum Retirement, um, you know, all these women have been working with me and, and coming along for my 20 year career. And I've been able to pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, I'm stumped here, or gosh, you know, I'm just in the middle of all this corporate drama, you know, can I talk through this with you? Or, hey, I'm having a really challenging patient any feedback, advice, or thoughts. And so that has been so paramount for me to feel like these women really believed in me and what I could achieve. Um, and they were honest with me about what I needed to learn and they showed me how to be a better leader. They didn't tell me, they showed me through their actions. So because I had great mentors, I knew that I really needed to pay that forward by mentoring young women in my organization. So um, I was, you know, pretty targeted about, you know, those young, smart, bright women um, in each of my organizations who either were not nailing it out of the park, but no one was recognizing, or they were quiet, or they were silent leaders that really needed to be kind of brought into the forefront um, and shine a light on them and, and teach them and work with them and say, look what you're good at. And, you know, what do you really want to do? 
Um, so I really made it my purpose to ensure that they continue to grow, find joy in their work. Um, and my husband and I made a decision early on that we were not going to have kids, but I kind of feel like when I winter these young women, I feel like I'm making a difference and perhaps I'm leaving a small legacy, or at least that's my hope to do. Yeah, I'm sure you are. Um, yeah, I, so from men, in terms of mentorship, I'll just uh, share from my end. Um, so I've, yeah. I've been practicing Nichiren Buddhism uh, with the SGI since 2009, so 12 years now, and a very crucial component uh, is the mentor-disciple relationship. And it could sound uh, intimidating or uh, a little obtuse to people without studying it, but it's the concept is that the mentor leads the way and the disciple follows, but the mentor's desire is for the disciple to surpass him or her. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that's a true mentor-disciple relationship, like this just long thread through history, essentially. Absolutely. You know? And that the, the mentor is not better, it's not, a, it's not a superior in any way, it's just that they, they deserve respect because they've walked the path and they can give you the knowledge that's going to help, help you, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so for, for us, it's super crucial as Buddhists and I can imagine in, in any career having that sort of person behind the scenes who's going to really show you the ropes while not, not babying you at the same time, yeah. right? Being tough. Yeah. And, and I was having a conversation with a woman today, actually a couple hours ago, who is leading an intergenerational mentorship program. And she's saying the hardest challenge that she's facing is that people don't want to be labeled as older and getting out of the workforce. And so a lot of people aren't mentors because they're simply not asked, which I thought was kind of an interesting concept. I think everyone wants to be a mentor, but not everybody asks, hey, John, would you be my mentor? So it makes a lot of sense. I think more people would want to be a mentor and more people would be mentored if they are just simply asked. And then also it feels good to be asked because you feel like, wow, I actually have something to offer because a lot of people don't have that confidence. So I thought that was an interesting concept, you know, to hear today mm -hmm. that if you just ask and then you just offer, right, it could be a mutual relationship throughout your life. I mean, these are these women that when I am literally crying, John, about something that's going on in work or my new business that I started, they are the ones that keep saying, keep going, Hannah, follow your North Star. And so without those cheerleaders in your life, you know, life is, is pretty plain and you wouldn't be doing such incredible things if you didn't have support of people around you. So, hmm. yeah, interesting concept uh, about like asking. Um, yeah. In, in also, again, in Buddhism, the, there's kind of like the, the, the part of the mentor disciple relationship is that the disciple chooses the mentor can never choose uh, mm -hmm. the disciple has to choose i this you're my mentor and then the mentor will rise to the occasion and i suppose there'll be a and there is like it, it's pretty specific it's not like anybody could be a mentor in this particular practice right but um which it took me a while to grasp it but i'm i appreciate i really appreciate it um because the mentors in this particular practice have really lay their lives on the line for the sake of peace and for creating yes. uh, a, a peaceful and harmonious world. Um, but yeah, and I know like in the in the 12 step traditions, um, there's this concept of sponsorship and then you actually ask for a sponsor. So I know that uh, that works. Yeah. And uh, I suppose if, if the person, if the older person could know that they have the right to say, I don't feel comfortable being a mentor or yes, I'll be your mentor. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to be me. So if you can accept me as I am, I'll do my best to, to support you. You know, because yeah. maybe people feel intimidated that being a mentor is going to mean they have to do something that they don't, they don't feel capable of or something. I don't know. I think a lot of people think mentorship in different ways, right? Like your definition of mentor is one thing, my definition. So I think it just comes down to someone saying, I want to learn from you. You're someone worthy of learning from. And, and as, from a mentor standpoint, me saying to a young lady or whoever, you're worth me giving my time and energy for. Like, I see something in you. And I think that makes people feel good when someone says something, gosh, you're worth it, right? You're really mm -hmm. worth it. And, and you have so many gifts. And let me help you get where you want to be. Because people need help, right? And they're open to it. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I also see in our society, this is a totally different topic, I'll just touch on it, is that yeah. um, there, there's, I've, I've listened to a lot of podcasts, just knowing people and this concept, uh, my father died when I was six, 
this concept of a fatherless society. Yes. Uh, uh, there's a lot of men for sure, of course women, but there's a lot of men that have grown up without a father, yes. uh, what, uh, through death or the father left or apps, you know, bogus dad or whatever, or the dad is in prison or something. And um, so then the, the, the child is not, or the, the boy in this case is not uh, shown that, that example doesn't have that mentorship that a father can provide in part. And then a lot of young boys don't grow into men. You know, they grow into older boys. And that's kind of like a, a, an issue in our society. Uh, I heard this from a, a priest actually who works in prisons. He explained this phenomenon. Um, I could see it, you know, I could see it around me because there's this like for older people to say, you know what? We actually are supposed to, the older generation, we're supposed to raise the young yeah. generation, whether they're our sons or our daughters or not, this is Correct. our job as a community. Yeah, you know, and if we and have think, that, you know, I, I think Michelle and uh, Michelle Obama and Barack Obama, towards the end of the administration, um, and I think they're doing this now. And you probably know this about uh, Barack Obama. He started uh, a male male mentorship, right? And it's become global. And I think the the it's exactly what you just said, John. Like young males need mentorship to become men. I hate using the word men, but Basically, you can't have young men become older young men, right? We need men to take responsibility to, you know, pay it forward as well, to live productive lives, to have be able to have a, a nurturing kind conversation. So I, I think I look a lot towards the Obamas, especially to Barack, to really think and recognize that that's an issue. And you just called it out. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So our, our uh, conversation is getting pretty colorful. So let's bring it back to you, Hannah. <laughs> um, so, uh, as a visionary and an executor, is that how I pronounce it? Executor. Um, uh, uh, what have been some of your greatest challenges? Yeah. So, um, you know, I love dreaming. I love planning. I love executing. Um, my other great passion in business is to start with a spark of ideas. I love ideas and assemble a rock star team, right? So you need an idea, you need an amazing team, and then brainstorm with that team on how we can make the idea better and then the build the bridge as we're crossing it. At work, people used to say, gosh, Hannah, you're, you're queen of building the bridge as you're crossing it. Um, and so I'm one of those people that's comfortable with learning as I go. And I know that not everybody's like that. So my biggest challenge is because I am someone that's comfortable moving as I go, I sometimes move too quickly. Shocker, right? I talk quickly as well. And I, I haven't really taken the time to sometimes stop, um, pause and reassess. So that's something that I'm learning, you know, right now in my career and in my life in general is, you know, I'm usually been the gas pedal, right? So I move forward, I move forward fast. And so I really need people around me who can be the break, right? Who can say, whoa, relax, slow down. And so as I've matured in my career and leadership style, I know this about myself now. So I know and I plan for upfront hiring people or having people around me who are smarter than me and who say no to me and stop and pause. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm sure that wasn't easy to learn, right? But um, <laughs> now that you right, it's never easy to have, you know, to be shown our our weaknesses. Uh, if if you want to look at it that way, it's not easy. But of course, it, we know that is going to help us grow. And I don't look at it as weakness. I mean, I think you need a you need a brake pedal and you need a an accelerator, right? I mean, if you have if you just have someone who's braking all the time, they're not going anywhere. So I think if you have multi functions of the car per se, I think you're moving forward. So right, or, or like a blind spot, right? We're we're exactly. focusing on this, so we're not seeing that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, I get that. All right, cool. Uh, so can you set the stage for us a bit about for those maybe who are struggling in their job or you know who could just maybe relate. Um, uh, maybe there's some people in a tough situation. Um, what was it like? What were the stress levels like? What was the circumstances like that led you to say, no, I'm not gonna do this job anymore, even though yeah. I had a fruitful career? Yeah, it's a great question. So I've been thinking about this a lot, John. You know, As a leader in healthcare, you have to be empathetic, right? You don't go into healthcare not liking people and not wanting to make a difference. So. As you're managing medical professionals, patients, and their families, that empathy always has to be at that surface, right? So even if you're having a bad day or you lose power, you put on a smile and you show up to work and you save lives. I mean, that's just virtually what you do. And I know, Allie, you can attribute this as well. I think it was just as simple as I gave too much of myself to my career. 
and I did not leave much left over for myself and my health. And so my body had been giving me warning signs for the last one or two years. I ignored them. I kept pushing the brake or the gas pedal. You know, it kept saying break, break, break. So then I would take a vacation. I returned back from vacation, but the stress was still there. And I think part of it was the pandemic and feeling disconnected from my team because I'm such a people person. And then the other piece was that I had outgrown my role, right? So I had lived and basically virtually grew up in healthcare for 20 years. And that's all I had ever done. And I loved it, but I think I was ready for something new. And I feel like I needed to be in a role where I had the flexibility to innovate and grow. And it wasn't with my organization at that time. You know, Kaiser is fabulous and it was such an amazing organization. It was my dream job. I was just ready to move on. And it was no fault of mine and no fault of theirs. And so I'm so happy that I did, that I took the moment to stop, pause, reassess, get myself well again, work on myself from the inside out. And now I feel like I'm truly living my destiny of making a real and true impact for women around the globe, which has always been, you know, my goal was when I traveled around the world, I saw what an impact I could make. And so now I'm basically returning to myself and returning back to the women of the globe saying, I'm here for you. How can I help you? Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. And I could very much relate, even though I didn't have that same high intensity job, of like uh, official job, I've taken on a lot of roles, a lot of responsibilities for years. I was just like, I don't know how much more I can keep going with this in, intense uh, schedule. And I, I did say no, beginning with the, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was having this like my, my heart pressure, like these weird physical symptoms. I had to slow down. When, when lockdown was announced, I was like, this is the answer to my prayers because I just want to stop and just, you know, go in, go inside. And yeah. then I just allowed that to happen and see my, you know, like, yeah, like you're saying, you grew, I grew out of various roles. I grew out of, I was evolving, you know, I was not the caterpillar anymore and I just couldn't go back to various roles and I had to say no to some things uh, since then that were challenging to say no to, but I just, in my Hard. I just knew I, there's no way I have my, I'm expanding my wings. It's very faith-based kind of like you're saying, building the bridges you're going. That's what I'm doing. But uh, I do feel now similar to yourself that I'm in a place where I could really just be myself and, and, and help people by being my, by truly being myself, you know, that's wonderful, John. I think, you know, I talk to a lot of women, hundreds of women, they, they're emailing me in droves saying, help me, help me. But a lot of them have also emailed me and said, Hannah, the pandemic was the best thing that could ever happen to me and my family because I actually stopped all the drama outside and just focused on what was really important. And I think, you know, a woman said it best, um, the coronavirus, you know, stopped me from living an ordinary life. And instead I'm living an extraordinary life. And I think that's so powerful. Yeah, it's beautiful. I, I, you know, I definitely take the uh, the optimistic approach on it of, on the coronavirus and see that, you know, I, I I'm a diabetic, and when I got di when I was diagnosed in my I was 33, it was super sad and depressing. But pretty quickly, I was able to turn around and say, "This is very good for me. It's like the perfect disease for me." Wow. Maybe, maybe one day I'll somehow outgrow it magically. I don't think so. Cause I'm a type one, but, uh, you know, anything's possible with science and faith, but, um, yeah, because I needed that. Like you said, you need someone to put a break for you. For me, yes. there were certain things in my lifestyle. I needed to be forced to do various things, certain ex you know, exercise routine, eating, yeah, uh, taking care of myself. So now diabetes puts me in that position where I have to take care of myself. And I think as a result, I'm healthier than I've ever been. Um, with that plus with the restriction right. um, yeah so I could see that and then when so when coronavirus came around for me I was like I just immediately said I'm going to use this to just be more myself you know there's always bad news no matter every single day you look at the news you can find yeah. bad news so I'm not going to let new bad news you know disturb me how can I continue to to self-care deepen my self-care and then give from that new deeper loving place you know so i don't burn out anymore that's wonderful john thanks yeah, for sharing you, that i think that's pretty powerful and i think all the listeners and everybody you know who could be watching this in the future like you got to find that place within yourself right and i think you changed your mindset you flipped a negative into how can i be healthier and and focus on wellness so that's great that's really great 
Yeah, thank you. Um, so now that you're on a healing journey, is that fair to say? Yeah. Um, uh, how have your daily priorities shifted from, let's say, a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, when you were like career woman, now you're not, or I mean, it's, it's, it's a different ball game. So, right. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, since I was the age of 22, I had two cell phones, John, I had a work phone and a, a work phone and a personal phone. And at my lowest of low, I was literally on two different conference calls on two of my phones. And so I wasn't present on either call. So that's, a, that was a typical morning for me, right? 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, roll over, grab my two phones, check both of my emails, multitasking to the point that I wasn't present in my life. And I know so many of you watching know what this is like to just go through life without being present. So fast forward to now, you know, I try to start every day with, this sounds really cheesy, but with a snuggle from Palmer, right? So we bought this mini Bernadoodle who's just a cuddly joy. And I just spend time with Peter and Palmer and I and tell them how much I love them, right? Today's a new day. Um, and then I, I got a quote, it's called 365 Truths. It's a, a pack of quotes. And I grab a quote every day and I reflect on that quote while I'm making a latte. And I sit down and I look outside or I sit down in my lady den and drink my latte and think about that quote. Sometimes I post it on the internet if it's a fabulous quote. Sometimes I just take it for myself and breathe deeply and think about think about that quote and how it translates into my life and how I can give back to others. So I take down um, I take time up front in the morning to write down my tasks for the day, which helps me really figure out what are my main focus goals. Right. So centering myself, I've been going to the gym every single day for an hour. And then I listen. You'll love this. I listen to a great playlist when I'm in the shower, because when I'm in the shower, I love to just feel the water, the rain on me. And I pick, you know, whether it's Led Zeppelin or reggae, all bluegrass folk, all different types of playlists. I ask my friends to send me new playlists and I enjoy music, right? Because I know how therapeutic that is. So I do that every day in the shower. My husband, it's, he's, it's driving him nuts, but you know, it's fun. So I try to do one thing each day with the core tenants being four things, love, mind, body, spirit. So love in the form of snuggles, mind in the form of my quote, body in the form of working out, spirit in the form of, you know, dancing in the shower or just taking care of myself and getting myself on in the right mood to set the tone for the right day. Wow. So that sounds a lot more, uh, I, I don't know, I guess, I don't tr believe it, but maybe to some, at a certain mindset, a lot less glamorous than uh, maybe, not not that waking up at five in the morning with two self was here is glamorous, but but you know, it, it, it's it's uh, it's beautiful in the most ordinary way. If that if that's fair, you know, it's like yep. oh, that's that's what life is about. Mm -hmm. Because it, I I would agree that must be super satisfying every day, um, because you're taking care of the most important things in your life, and therefore you're giving naturally. You have this abundant energy of or, or high vibration to to share. You know, because you're putting yourself first in in, in a health in the healthiest way. Well, and I'm more present. I think that's what it comes down to. I used to read all of these like Joseph Campbell books or, you know, mind, body, spirit. And I used to honestly roll my eyes and be like, oh God, here's another, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh thing. But the reality is when you're moving through life totally unpresent, you miss everything, John, you know this. I mean, you miss everything. And, you know, with the pandemic happening and just kind of almost being smacked over the head saying life is short, life is too short. We all, you know, we all could have died, right? And so it's really figuring out what is so important to you and what is right in front of you. Because it's usually friends and family, right? And yourself, so. Yeah, yeah, it did. the John Lennon quote jumps in out of my head. Uh, it, life is what happens when you're busy making plans. Right. You know, what, what a sad thing that a lot of people do live that way. And of course, you know, I have lived that way quite a bit. Right. Um, feeling like I'm, this is what I'm supposed to do, you know? Like, you know. I love that quote. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. And um, by the way, I'm, my wife is Yoko. So we're John and Yoko. If you didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're very different, John and Yoko, but there's that connection. We can't get away from it. Um, yeah. The presence thing, you know. Similar, uh, so I, I write my um, to-do list. I tend to do it the night before. It's kind of like this programming so that 
the next day and end up doing like 90% of what I write down. I have also learned how to reduce all the things I put down. Or if I just spend one minute on something, I still give it a check mark to feel. Oh, like I love that. I've honored it, you know? Yeah. And uh, yeah, and I start off with chanting and I, I like, I've experimented with meditation. Chanting is a meditation. So um, if I stretch, sometimes I walk, but yeah, that morning time is super precious. Uh, starting off that day with with a positive energy and, and taking that moment to really be present, Absolutely. enter the body, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think we're up to the point where you're about to tell us about She Shatters, if, if you're yeah. up to the test. I got my t-shirt on today, my She Shatters t-shirt on, if you can oh, see. Oh, sweet. <laughs> so that's a, is that a, a um, butterfly, like made of glass or made of uh, something, you know? Breakable? That's exactly what it is, John. You hit the mm -hmm. nail on the head. It is a butterfly, which signifies obviously transformation, right? So going from a caterpillar to a butterfly, and then the glass signifies shattering glass. So I think when all of us are kind of at our lowest low, you're not really doing a lot of shattering glass, but when you are fully transformed as a butterfly, um, you know, sky's the limit, right? Um, for men and women, right? It doesn't just have to be for women. So um, I think that a lot of us have have really been in the incubation period, right? The last year and a half, two years with coronavirus. And I think a lot of us are kind of incubating and trying to figure out what's next for our lives. So this logo was actually created, um, chosen by our community. So we basically put up a couple logos up and asked our women of She Shatters which logo they liked and they chose this one. So this is what we went with. Nice, that's, a good, that's definitely a way to make it uh, a communal communal thing absolutely um, yeah i love that so so she shatters in the context you described it i didn't think of it that way so are you saying that shattering is almost like a good thing yes i think shattering i think you literally have to break the person who you were in order to find out the person that you become so this break can come in the form of coronavirus right it can smack you across the state and say, do you want to live the life that you were living? It can come in the form of, gosh, I just got laid off my job. And you think it's the worst thing that could have ever happened to you, but it's actually the world or the universe saying you're destined for something better. It's your burnout moment when you're, you know, your head's on the bottom on your desk and you're crying and you're like, gosh, I can't stand my boss. How, why did he or she treat me like this? And you realize I'm better than this. I don't deserve to be treated like this. And then you get on uh, online, you find the better job and you're moving forward. So I think it comes down to shattering that, that identity, that person you were before and being reborn into the true and beautiful you that you were destined to be. And we talked a lot about this at the book doulas, right? Is what is really the most real and true for you and living your life at that capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. She shatters. It's definitely a, a memorable uh, phrase, two words, you know, and yeah. S-H-E, S-H again, I like that. The alliteration there. Um, so, so she shatters. I, I, I'm understanding now the more clearly the, the concept and uh, encouraging people that the what they might perceive as a low or a setback could be like the you know like I was saying with diabetes or yes. you know it could be the moment you're waiting for to really redefine a more pure version of yourself, or the Correct. purest you know. Yeah. So. So I'm curious, so what can, let's say a woman, there are women out there watching this and they're like, I want to know more. What could you offer maybe um, for a woman who's curious to learn how she shatters being part of the community, how that could benefit her? Yeah, so we basically have uh, four products. You know, the first product is really our Burn Right Toolkit. So our, our tagline is how to burn bright and not burn out, right? So you're shattering who you were, you're moving into the light, but how do you do that? And a lot of self-help companies and self-awareness companies, they just say, you know, take a walk, listen to music, meditate, you know, that type of thing. This is really um, a different perspective in that we are asking women to look deep inside themselves and basically excavate who they were and dig deep into figuring out what are my dreams? What do I stand for? Um, how do I set boundaries? How do I have a conversation with my husband or my kids about putting myself first? And how do I lead the next generation to understand how important it is to put myself first? So we have a burn bright toolkit. We have a tips, five tips on how to burn bright, which is a small kind of 10, 12 page booklet. We also have a larger toolkit, which is a, um, a kind of a visionary exercise of, you know, what are your dreams? 
what is your plan? What is the life you want to live? And then we have exercises to help you get there. Um, and then we offer uh, corporate resilience packages. So I've been speaking to several um, companies who are interested in changing the mindset from burnout, right? The old preventative model of burnout to wellness and prevention. And how can we work with our retaining uh, female employees in those large organizations? So I will be speaking or a member of my team will be speaking to these organizations uh, for a flat fee um, and providing them the Burn Bright toolkit and also resources for their employees and managers on what to look for burnout and how to prevent burnout. So we have multiple um, uh, tools. We also are going to be launching our podcast, which I think you and I've talked about, um, and that'll yep. be launched in a couple weeks. Um, where we're talking to women around the world on how to burn bright. We've got from you know burnout and libido to burnout and somatic system to how to talk to your families about burnout and how to save yourself from burnout. So I'm really looking forward to that podcast coming up in August. Yeah, wow, that's exciting. So I'm thinking, I mean, I can see your burning bright thing right now um, very much. And I, I would love to, I mean, I guess probably wouldn't be participating in the type of thing myself of being a man, but I'd like, I could see you doing, I don't know, uh, online workshops, you know, uh, some sort of opportunity. Uh, I don't know, I don't know if you have a YouTube channel, but just simply videos of you sharing the philosophy um, is just very powerful because of how passionate you are, you know, and if, if, if people could somehow have an ac access to you too, I don't know if you figured out all the levels you know, this is new and it's a lot of evolution ahead, I'm sure. But um, yeah, it's very exciting and I could see a lot of potential. Thanks for and saying that. You know, John, I know you get this when you're thinking about either starting a book or a company. And I think we talked about this in our book doula class. You know, for so long when I was thinking about starting this company, I didn't want to speak in public, right? Because I'm not comfortable doing that. And when I started talking to women offline or just those people that know me like you or Allie or Haley, they're like, you need to talk in public and share your story because that is going to make or break your company. And I had to really decide, John, if I was going to be vulnerable and be on stage or be on the screen because it's, you know, not my comfort level. Um, but I think it, you know, part of this being brilliance or trying to change from burnout to brilliance is I can't ask women to excavate who they were before and get rid of their fears unless I do it myself. So I'm doing it. It's scary, but it's mm. really, really exciting and fun. So I appreciate the encouragement. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, I see that knowing you for a little bit behind the scenes, I see that this is, you know, this is no easy thing, but uh, I do see that you're doing it and you rise into the occasion. And uh, I, I felt when, when I wanted to ask some people on podcasts, you were the one of the first that came to mind because I figured you would say, yes quickly you know <laughs> and and you did so um because you have that uh energy even if it i remember you know seeing that it's not easy you know doing what you're doing but you still are doing it right so yes yes and ali says you got it darling with three count them three exclamation points oh i love ali she's such a good cheerleader yeah oh yeah she's Allie. fantastic yeah, I feel like I've still seen Allie a lot since the class, um, maybe because we're in a rebirth community together. Yeah. Um, were you uh, part of Lee Harris's uh, group or you came in from another door? Um, I came in from another door. You know, I certainly get his emails and, you know, listen to his monthly updates, which I love. You know, it's really interesting. You know, I came to the book doula class from a recommendation from my mom. She forwarded me an email and I'm so glad that she did. A lot of those mom I ignore, but I was so glad that I actually looked at this one and enrolled in the class. But, um, you know, Lee Harris is a, a transformational leader. And I think all of us just kind of, he's our, a guru to us. And we just really appreciate all the vibration, the positive vibrations he's giving out in the world. So I think mm. we just all kind of aspire to be a, a true leader like he is. Yeah, I would say he's uh, definitely a mentor to many of us. I would put him in that category uh, uh, readily because Good. the path he's he's um, laying out is a unique path that I never saw before in the world. And it's not something I would choose by my will, but it's something my energy is kind of choosing for me to do. You know, he has a podcast and his podcast, when I listen to him, like, this is the kind of thing I want to do, you know? So, yeah. you know, I could listen to him and learn from, he's, he's several steps ahead of me, you know? Uh, so he, he's a mentor in that sense. Did you know in um, Japanese, 
the word sensei, which means teacher, uh, it just sen and say, it just means a head in life. So it, it doesn't mean like superior, bow down to me or anything. It just means a head in life. So, you know, there's that, I, I like to think of, of uh, being a teacher myself in that respect and the teachers I have around me as, you know, they're ahead in life, so why not honor them? And, you know, if I'm ahead in, of, in life it's in relation to a younger person or someone else, then I have a responsibility to them or the potential to, to aid them in some way. Absolutely agree. I think it's, you know, really important for any generation, X, Y, you know, baby boomers, like we need to look at the path that was paved before us and we need to pave our own path, but we also need to acknowledge um, the path that other people chose. So I think, you know, acknowledging it, honoring it, and also leading your own path and teaching, teaching up and teaching down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then also like the spirit of this podcast um, is actually reaching out. So right. I, I see a lot of podcasts, <clears throat> I'm not criticizing it as wrong or anything, but I just see a whole lot of podcasts aim more towards kind of reaching up and saying, uh, tell me what you know, how are you so successful or something to that effect. When I'd rather just reach out to my friends or my peers yeah. or people who are like real right. and just have ordinary, uh, well, person to person, heart to heart dialogue that Correct. ordinary people can say, yeah, that's, that sounds like me, you know, and, and just kind of gain something from that. And I think that's where the richness and rawness comes in. I mean, I'm going to do the same thing with, with our um, She Burns podcast. I, I say very clearly, we're talking to real women about real issues. No bullshit, right? I mean, it's real issues, real women, and we're talking about tough conversations, right? We're talking about sex and libido and parenthood and, you know, what it's like to, to say no, which is such a hard word for a lot of us to say. So I totally agree with you. I mean, I think having real people on your podcast, it's not about getting the best celebrity or a comedian on there. I mean, certainly that would be fun, but having real people, John, is really important. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, and I think that that's where we're headed. And because I felt there's a lack of that. I want to listen to various podcasts. There are a few that were kind of, I'm saying low level, meaning like I could relate to the guests, you know, it wasn't right. so like, oh yeah. And I have uh, 20,000 subscribers. And when I, then when I sold 10,000 books, I'm like, right. Okay. Now I don't feel so great, <laughs> you know, Yeah. but right. uh, you know, not like success is good, but I, I also wanted that. Why shouldn't the person, why can't I grab the guy on the corner or the woman on the corner and just bring him in and, hear about their life and that be a show why right. not you right. know so just trying to bring it into that uh, realm of um every man or every woman i think that's know. wonderful yeah i support it yeah it sounds like you're doing the very same thing <laughs> um so let's see uh what aspects of your life philosophy help you to recover from setbacks i'm sure there's been a few setbacks along the journey and what's your life philosophy that's keep you burning bright even now, you know, at your age after so much life has happened. Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't think you guys know this about me. I don't think Hallie and Allie and all these people know about me, but um, I think being raised by a therapist and having parents who taught me at a young age how important it was for me to share my feelings with others really helped me shift my focus from a setback mentality to a push forward mentality, right? So, I was taught that mistakes and failures are okay. And being an only child, you know, I had a lot of them and a lot of scrutiny, um, but I just needed to acknowledge, reflect and learn from those mistakes before trying again. So of course, you know, I felt like whenever time I made a mistake or, you know, an error or almost made a mistake, my mom would say, well, what did you learn from that? And how did that make you feel? It was very like therapist, but um, I joke about it now, but I think ultimately, um, the reflection part was the biggest learning opportunity for me because um, you have to know what didn't go well to know how to make things better. And that really served me not only in my management and leadership style, but also provided a lot of grace in my friendships, my relationships, and those who know me know if you make a mistake, just own up to it. Or, you know, if it's something I need to work on, just be honest with me. But I think having that communication of let's work through it. Um, is, is really my philosophy. We can get through anything as long as we're together, we're honest and we work through it, so. Mm -hmm. Wow, cool, yeah, I didn't know, uh, I didn't realize both parents psychologists. <laughs> Thank God, no, uh -huh. just my mom. Yes, uh -huh. my dad was very, you know, type A, um, Harvard graduate, you know, um, so he pushed me in a lot of different ways, but my mom um, 
really helped me nurture my heart and soul and really encouraged me to use my voice. And frankly, I think both of my parents helped me become the strong person I am today because they would actually ask my opinion. You know, when we're traveling around the world and I'm four years old and six years old and they're asking me, you know, where do I want to go next or what do I want to eat or, you know, actually gave me choices. I think mm -hmm. a lot of kids aren't given choices and they're just like, here, eat this or here, we're doing this, but actually give choices. It makes you understand the importance of your voice and making yeah. the right choice, frankly, because if you make the wrong choice, then, you know, there's an impact. So Yeah, you got to live with it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow, that's cool. Yeah, we, we definitely, uh, my wife and I love to engage our son in things. Uh, he definitely seems like an old soul and, you know, we talk to him like an adult and I don't see anything wrong with that, you know. No. We, we you know, guide him when he's off kilter, but otherwise respect him as a fellow human, you know. That's correct. Yeah, I think that's right on. Lucky uh, son. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and we're lucky parents too. He's, he's a good one. Uh, so what um, can you share up to three inspiring, if you have more that you can't help but share, then go ahead, three inspiring books, films, TV shows, if that's your thing, or I don't know, YouTube shows that you would like to recommend to our listeners. Let's say people are feeling a little bit down uh, from whatever, if it's pandemic related or just kind of, I don't know, a little stuck or people could be feeling great too. What, what would you recommend that kind of inspirational type of thing? Sure. So I have, I, I got a, a one film for you, one um, Netflix show for you, and one book. So the film is Nomadland. A lot of you probably have seen this. Um, it's really, it's on Netflix and it's on Amazon, but it's really about taking a risk and highlights the power of storytelling, right? So it's a bunch of people who have been, you know, laid off and cha challenging times during the pandemic and really, you know, about living a nomadic lifestyle. And I think right now that's really popular for a lot of people is living this nomadic lifestyle, but these are people that actually were forced to do it. And I just think it, there's an incredible piece of power of storytelling in that. Um, the second one is Derek. Now my mom recommended this show. It's a, it's a show on Netflix and it's, I think it's Ricky Gervais who normally plays a really interesting kind of jerk character. But in this show, he's uh, playing a, a young gentleman with kind of spectrum of autism, special needs. And it's about his lens of the world through kindness, right? So he believes everything and everyone should be kind. And every episode is about a, a different episode and demonstration of how it is and what it's like to be kind. So I would highly recommend that. And then the book that I'm, or audio book that I'm super, super hyped on right now is called The Wolf Pack. Um, which is from the famous soccer star, female soccer star, Abby Wambach. And it's really a leadership manifesto on women. And so when I'm feeling kind of down or feeling like I need kind of a, a coach or a pick me up, I listen to her audiobook, and she's just, she's truly my hero. Um, I would love to have her on my podcast and just love to have a conversation with her because she's one of those women that is so inspiring and she's a leader, but she doesn't know it. Right. And I love that. I love women who are just blazing the trail, kicking ass, but they just don't know it. And I love that. Mm -hmm. So if I get that right, no, no mad land. Is that no right? mad land? Yes. Is that a movie or a it's show? It's a movie That's on a movie. Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. Okay, Amazon and Netflix. And then uh, Derek. Derek's on Amazon Netflix. Amazon show. It's on. It's on Netflix. Sorry. Yeah. That's a show, TV show on yes. Netflix. Correct. All right, and then uh, the Wolf Pack is book audio book. It's an audio book and a small book. Yes. Okay, I'll put the links in the show notes. Um, cool. I didn't know about Nomadland, so that's post-pandemic thing. You'd love it, yeah. Cool, yeah, and Derek sounds good. Would Derek be kid-friendly? Uh, maybe like teenager-friendly, but not younger. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I was you're asking about someone that. that doesn't have. You're asking someone that doesn't have kids, John. But I think I, I think I gave the right answer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes, I'm always because he's he's almost my son's almost always around when the TV's on, unless we stay up kind of late and we usually yeah. don't. So, yeah. um, cool. All right, so let's see. Uh, so, what are your plans in the upcoming several months? Uh, I think we got a little bit of an idea with building your 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 business even more on the podcast. But if there's anything you haven't shared yet, you want to share. Yeah, I mean, I think for me right now, John, it's just building a community of women who are learning for ways to 
discover who they are and what's important to them. And I wanna focus on creating partnerships with big organizations who are interested in shifting their work cultures from the old productivity and burnout paradigm, you know, that old grind to a more balanced and brave wellness prevention model. And I know I'm reading the articles and I'm seeing them on LinkedIn and Wall Street Journal and my family sending me articles all the time. Now is the time, the moment is ripe to really have some culture change, not only at an organizational level, but an internal level for women. We're craving something bigger and better. And she shatters mm -hmm. that. She, I believe she shatters is that place. So. Wow, great. Awesome. And uh, so the podcast we're looking at hopefully August or something? Yes, we're already booking um, guests. It's just a matter of getting my webpage, my second webpage launched, and that should be done by the end of this week. Um, we have a current website, but we are rebranding our website and we'll have a new launching page probably the first week of July. So you know how things go. We've only been open 10 weeks and we've gotten a lot done. So I'm just trying to be patient. <laughs> right. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes the, the most important thing is to uh, just hold that patient space. Sometimes there's nothing to do, but it's kind of like send love to the plant, you know? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I know. Um, and uh, finally, uh, where can people find you? I mean, I'm going to put the, the website there and learn more about what you're doing in the world and what you offer, sheshatters.com. Sheshatters.com, yes. Okay, and, uh, and the Facebook, yeah, and Facebook link I'll put there as well. So, yeah. wow, that's, uh, that's pretty much all I've got, uh, got in terms of questions. Is there anything you'd like to add, uh, Hannah? I don't think so. I just really appreciate you having me on the podcast and just love what you're doing, John. I just believe in, I've read um, some of your, your writing and just really excited to, about meeting you and just really enjoyed our conversation. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Hannah Austin. And uh, looking forward to seeing you making waves in the world. And uh, this show will be up on YouTube soon too. I'll send you the links so you can share with your community if you'd like to. Thank you. All right, thanks Bye, so much, everyone. Hannah. Have a great night. You too. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Bye, guys. Thank you. Take care.